If you were to ask even the most vocal of prequel lovers which of those three films was the undisputed weakest of the bunch, there's a solid chance most would point to Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. That's just the way it is. Following on from unpacking all of the fascinating things learned when taken in Episode 1 recently then, it felt like as good a time as any to fire up the 2002 follow-up. So I am Gareth, this is What Culture Star Wars, and here are 10 things you learn from re-watching Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Number 10, the Anakin Padme dialogue has entered so bad it's good territory. One of the biggest criticisms of this prequel back when it first arrived in theatres all those years ago was how George Lucas handled the central romance of Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala. A combination of a lack of electric chemistry shared between actors Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman, and some of the most agonising dialogue the Star Wars creator had ever put down on paper, and that is saying something, made for a rather painful early stage of forbidden love. But watching everything from Anakin's awkward chat about his disdain of sex and to the pairs frolicking in the fields of Naboo in 2024 actually brings with it an unexpected wave of nostalgia. That's right, we've now seemingly hit the point, likely thanks to the many glorious memes these scenes inspired down the road, where Anakin joking about dictatorships, floating pairs to his future wife, and the chosen one being haunted by the pair's smooch doesn't leave you wincing in your seat. Instead, don't be surprised if you end up occasionally becoming Rick Dalton, pointing and celebrating each and every time a wonderfully terrible piece of flirting or an overly intense profession of love occurs. And you also realise on a rewatch that there are actually a few genuinely sweet moments sprinkled in there too. The heavily ad-libbed floaty pair scene in particular is rather lovely really, which suggests that the clearly talented Christensen and Portman could have really clicked with some stronger text to work with. And speaking of dialogue in Star Wars, I want to know right now what is your favourite line in all of Star Wars? You let me know in the comments section down below. It better have something to do with sand. Number 9, Across the Stars is a top 5 Star Wars banger. Staying on the subject of that doomed romance in Attack of the Clones, something else also becomes abundantly clear when re-immersing yourself in this bodyguard assignment. John Williams did not mess around when it came to their love theme. Whether it's tinkling away in the background as the two talk over a bowl of grub, or swelling to an emotional climax when they engage in their first forbidden lip lock, Across the Stars enhances just about everything it touches during these romantic moments. As beautifully delicate and fragile as this secret love affair is at one moment, then as strong and unstoppable as their passion the next. Williams added yet another all-time Star Wars banger to his overflowing collection here, and it's easily a top 5 theme not just in the prequels but in the Skywalker saga as a whole. Hell, it's such a moving tune, it even helps awkward lines like Amidala's I truly, deeply, love you one on Geonosis feel somewhat epic. Number 8, the decade age jump does not work for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, no one is denying that the great Ewan McGregor is one of the true highlights of the prequels, and that much sticks out again during a revisit of Attack of the Clones. His Obi-Wan Kenobi really starts to grow into the wise and legendary master he'd ultimately become here, cracking fantastic one-liners, keeping his Padawan learner in line, and holding his own against bounty hunters, battle droids, and Count Dooku. For a bit, at least. However, that still doesn't change the fact that the attempts to make the actor who had only aged three years in real life between episode one and two shoots look like he'd added 10 years onto his clock for this film set a decade after The Phantom Menace just did not work. Sure, the mullet and beard look was definitely an iconic one, I mean look at that thing, but all that facial fuzz still doesn't convince you that you're watching anything other than a performer in his late 20s pretending to be a 35 year old Jedi. And that's without even touching on the absolutely horrendous fake beard glued to the star's mug during reshoot scenes that only become more painfully obvious during a Disney Plus rewatch. They had a go, but the force just was not strong with this age up. Number 7, just how long it takes for the best character to show up. While there's still no denying that incredible talents like Samuel L. Jackson and Natalie Portman are still largely wasted in this 2002 space opera, it is worth remembering that Attack of the Clones also boasts some properly mesmerizing performances too. And though an occasionally fake bearded Hugh McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi, and always engaging Ian McDiarmid as an increasingly sinister Palpatine both definitely deliver in their returns, it's a debuting character who really steals the show on a rewatch, which is even more impressive once you remember that he only bloody 
suddenly shows up more than halfway through the thing. His name may be uttered a few times in the lead up, but the captivating Christopher Lee's one-time Jedi, Count Dooku, only actually arrives on screen when Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up on Geonosis, well over an hour into the runtime. With Dooku unquestionably acting as the film's primary antagonist throughout, even with Palpatine pulling the strings in the shadows, many probably remember it feeling like the Separatist leader was present in the film way more than he actually is. It's ridiculously impressive just how commanding and complex a portrayal Lee manages to cram into less than 10 minutes of overall screen time. And his intriguing exchanges with McGregor and Jackson and general presence as the secret Darth Tyrannus have only gotten better with age. Number 6. Django and Boba Fett and Dooku's showings are enhanced by stories that followed. Something else that has also helped make Christopher Lee's magnetic work as Count Dooku feel like even more of a treat during a rewatch is the existence of all of the new, brilliant media outside of the Skywalker Saga pictures. Dooku's arc in the magnificent Tales of the Jedi animation alone helped paint a more detailed picture of a conflicted Jedi Master who had seen the corruption of the Senate up close and was willing to take a walk on the dark side to put an end to it, even killing poor Jedi Master Yaddle before the events of Episode 2 to prove his loyalty to his new master, Darth Sidious. Along with this show and Claudia Gray's Master and Apprentice and Caven Scott's Dooku Jedi Lost books making Dooku feel like a more fully formed character, it also adds that little more weight to his words about Qui-Gon to Obi-Wan in Attack of the Clones, with the impact of the loss of his one-time Padawan hitting that little harder after seeing the two in action together during that show. The same could be said of the Fett boys, Jango and Boba too. Knowing just how much the death of Jango affected his son in the years that followed his decay decapitation on Geonosis, seen in his attempts to get revenge on Mace Windu in the Star Wars The Clone Wars animated series, for example, makes that moment in particular feel way more weighty on a rewatch. And you also come to appreciate just how underrated a performer Tamura Morrison is too, with the subtle differences between his cold-hearted but dedicated father Django and the slightly more caring badass he'd become as Boba in The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett certainly being a noticeable feature here. Cheers for checking out this video today, folks, and if you are enjoying what you're watching today, then hit that subscribe button down below for more of this What Culture Star Wars stuff in your day. Number 5. The Sound Design is Next Level Up Points Keeping with that pair of Fett legends, the noise Django and masterful sound designer Ben Burtt gifted the world during his asteroid field chase with Obi-Wan Kenobi simply gets better with every breathtaking watch of it. But throughout your return to this spell in the galaxy far, far away, you soon remember that these epic seismic charge explosions, which Bert effectively described as an audio black hole, are just one of the many tremendous pieces of sound design present in this particular episode. Things like the thunderous noise of an entire Trade Federation ship dropping back down to the sandy Geonosian land with an almighty thud, various distinct and unsettling roars of the Akle, Nexu, and Reek trying to rip apart our heroes in the arena, and whizzing sound of Coruscant traffic soaring through the sky all help make the unbelievable visuals seen on screen feel somewhat real. The galaxy far, far away obviously boasts a ton of iconic sound effects, with many of the most celebrated originally showing up in the original trilogy. But a rewatch of Episode 2 makes you realize that Bert and the gang's impressive work in this middle prequel doesn't get anywhere near as much love as it deserves. Number 4. Yoda is extremely unhelpful in a battle situation with Master Yoda ultimately being remembered more for his still hugely silly flippy duel with Dooku than anything else he did during that first battle of Geonosis, it's easy to forget that he was also intentionally a bit of a pain in the ass as a Jedi general on the front line here. Thanks to the iconic way this little green legend chooses to utter his words, there's more than a few occasions which stand out as all kinds of unhelpful during a rewatch of that all-timer of a Star Wars battle. Take the moment he arrives on the scene with his new clone pals. Instead of giving out a clear order here, something that could be the difference between life and death in a war zone, Yoda utters the clunky command of around the survivors a perimeter create. Uh, okay boss. Robot Chicken would brilliantly poke fun at this bizarre moment in particular a few years back. But even without knowledge of that sketch, it still feels incredibly jarring when watched back today. And making matters worse after delivering more back to front orders. Yoda then just goes back to speaking like a normal being when telling his troops to concentrate all your fire on the nearest starship. So he could talk fine this whole time and was just being awkward for the hell of it, basically. Number 3. The best part of the movie goes down in a diner 
While young Anakin is off protecting Padme Amidala and definitely not falling in love with her, his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi, sets out to find the bounty hunter who'd been trying to kill the senator. It's that investigation which suddenly takes him to a little eatery on Coruscant, one ran by the Jedi Knight, old pal Dexter Jetster. Yes, that is one of the best names in all of Star Wars. And you know what? After taking Lucas's bold but perhaps not entirely well-executed prequel for another ride, it was this scene which really felt like the most fascinating of the entire picture. Watching Kenobi learn about Kamino as he brought his pal who'd clearly lived a hell of a life, the toxic dart fired at Zam Wessel earlier in the movie, felt like the sort of thing you'd find in a mystery thriller, not a family-friendly space opera. Everything from the bustling diner aesthetic to Dex's intense comments on the Kaminoan cloners being friendly if your pocketbook was big enough, just made you long for more of these engrossing Jets to Kenobi interactions. And ultimately, the rest of Kenobi's dragged out mission is nowhere near as interesting as that two minute booth chat with the shady cook. It's quite honestly the highlight of the whole damn movie, and something that feels like it should have inspired its own Disney Plus spin off series by now. Who wouldn't want to see this odd couple solve the galaxy's crimes and water it all down with Jawa juice on the small screen? Number two, the fight choreography is noticeably worse than episode one. Especially in the wake of recently taking in the lightsaber dueling masterpiece that is the Duel of the Fates on the big screen, Episode 2's laser sword choreography feels like a massive backwards step on a rewatch. Now, Lucas and Co. could obviously only do so much with a Christopher Lee who was 79 at the time of shooting his lightsaber duels with Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, and Yoda, but even after digitally slapping his face onto a stunt double for big chunks of these fights, the end result still doesn't feel anywhere near as intense, creative, or exciting as the prior film's climactic laser sword action. The lightsaber light show moment was a nice attempt to do something a little different as Anakin and Dooku duke it out before the former's arm is sliced off, sure, but even that ended up feeling more like a force-sensitive rave than a pulsating showdown. And as already noted, that flubber Yoda nonsense has aged horribly too, with the visual of the master opting to pull out a tiny little lightsaber and bounce around the hangar, turning an icon into a joke in a matter of minutes. That Kenobi Fett slip and slide Kamino fight though? Now there's a good time right there. Number one, it's not actually the worst Star Wars movie ever made anymore. For over 15 years, just about every Star Wars fan out there had a go-to answer when it came to their undisputed least favorite Star Wars picture. And it wasn't that difficult to understand why, really. The move from shooting on film for The Phantom Menace to digital for Attack of the Clones definitely took something away from the overall experience, with the visuals just not feeling as sharp as in that former prequel. Also, Lucas's decision to rely heavily on blue screen backgrounds and CGI in general, while definitely a bold one, ultimately led to a film which now feels more like a giant digital experiment than an attempt to create a good-looking and cohesive piece of cinema. Yet even with all that said, as this list has shown time and time again, Attack of the Clones still has enough going for it to safely move away from that bottom spot in a post-sequel trilogy world. Sure, it isn't a perfect watch or rewatch by any means, but at least Lucas had the guts to do something unexpected and take the galaxy far, far away in an entirely new direction with his prequel baby. The same could not be said for the overly nostalgic mess that was episode Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, a film that lacked any real originality, rarely made sense, and has now safely usurped Episode 2 as the worst of the Skywalker saga bunch. And on that positive note, see you later!